Welcome to another episode of the All Turtles Podcast, a show about entrepreneurship and AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder at All Turtles. Today is the first half of a two-part episode. Phil Libin and I conduct the first half of an interview with Jason Calacanis. Jason is an entrepreneur and investor whose investments include Uber, Thumbtack, Datastax, Robinhood, Wealthfront, and a wealth of other great companies. And he shares some of his extensive knowledge on how startups should be building a brand. Then, Kathy Dinas, chief of staff at All Turtles, joins Phil and I to talk about an AI use case that Phil recently encountered. And we answer a listener question about a new All Turtles product. So we're in Donatello. We're in the studio today with Jason Calcanis. And Jason... What, what? <laughs> entrepreneur, a significant angel investor, kind of one of the best known, probably the best known. Uh, early investor in Uber, Thumbtack, Datastax, Robinhood, kind of a number of really significant companies. Author uh, of a great book, uh, Angel, you. Timeless Advice. And, and what I really appreciate is an early advocate for unedited content on the internet. For sure. So, so thank you for driving that forward. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us. Nice to see you, Jason. Nice to see you, sir. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for hosting. So the show generally is about dispensing dispensing practical wisdom to entrepreneurs, specifically in the field of AI, but it c- kind of spans different, different directions. Sure. And the first one I want to talk about is a topic that I think both of you have a lot of thoughts on, and that's brand. So we had a listener question. It's actually come in multiple times. Um, whether Same or not, listener, just really persistent. Yeah, exactly. They wrote a script or something. Were they in the lobby? We're finally getting back to this oh. listener. All right. And the question was whether or not a startup should have a podcast to talk about what they're working on, kind of establish a voice in the industry. And what struck me with this question is that it wasn't about starting a podcast. It was about starting a brand. And, you know, I, I think about launch as becoming such a significant brand in the early stage ecosystem and not just launch, you know, kind of all your projects that's Silicon yeah. Valley Reporter and weblogs and all these things. Um, and Phil, I think I know your opinion on the importance of brand kind of out of the gate. Um, and maybe you guys could kind of just wrap on this topic. But so why is brand so important uh, from sure. the very start of things? Well, I mean, if you think about what a company is, it's a it's a typically a group of people who are trying to build a product or a service uh, that they want or they think the world wants. It sounds and rational. Consumers really care about the intentionality of products. They care about who made them. They want to know the backstory. And just like in great filmmaking or great television, they might take a bit character and they might really build a big backstory for them so that the actor can then fill in that role. And Better Call Saul comes to mind with Breaking Bad. Like they've now filled in that entire backstory. But that character was so minor and now, but it was so rich. Same thing is true of your startup. You know, you're building, you know, Evernote or you're building Engadget, the pod, the, you know, the blog like I did or Inside Now or email newsletters. You might want to know why I'm doing it. You might want to know who the team is. And once you know that and you understand their intentionality, you can build super fans and super fans um, exist for all products, whether it's a Tesla or a piece of enterprise software or a meditation app. And those super fans are going to spread the word for you. They're going to go to war for you if you ever get into a battle with anybody, right? And they are going to be super critical and honest with you at times and and really help you build the product. So getting out there, um, I like that idea. Your original question was, should everybody have a podcast? Podcasting is a specific type of media. It takes a certain type of person to do it consistently over time. But they are very powerful because you're in somebody's ears like we are right now, to you, the listener. Yes, you, the person who were in your ears. You're in, get your you air got up. two of them. To Jim. Both exactly. of them. Exactly. <laughs> Both, Both of you. Of them, yeah. <laughs> but the, the people who, when you are in somebody's ears for an hour, it's super powerful. People meet me, you know, I was in Qatar. Somebody just walked by me on the street. I was like, this weekend startups. It's like, great. You know, and Chris Hawk episode, you know, like they just like yell something at me. And it creates something I call asymmetrical intimacy, which is a fancy way of saying celebrity. People walk up to me. They know me. They know how I think. They know the name of our dogs. They know my daughter. They know I have twins. They know where I live. They know my car. They, they just know that I like the Knicks. And they're going to start on third base with me in terms of talking. And so 
people don't realize this, but we've done 850, 900 episodes of This Week in Startups. It does over a million dollars. There's six people who work on it. Wow. It's 100 episodes a year, sold out for two or three months in advance. Now, this is in year nine or 10 of the podcast. But what they don't realize is nine out of 10 of my investments are either on the podcast or came from somebody who listened to the podcast. So I get people to take me on as an angel investor, allow me to invest in their companies, and then I promote them on the other side. So it's this wonderful, conflicted, awesome device for me. Yeah, I was on This Week in Startups pretty early in the Evernote days. You were one of the yeah. first people to have me on, and it was like, I think at that point, it was by far the biggest like exposure that we'd had. I had, like, had people talking about it, yeah, coming up to me at random places for, for a couple of years. It's yeah. kind of surprisingly, uh, surprisingly powerful. Yeah, what you it's surprising to you, but not to me, because I'll tell you what happens. Phil Libin, 10 years ago, nobody knew who a, what a Phil Libin was. They don't know what Evernote is. Then as they find out about it, they search on Google or yep. they're doing some research on you, your company. They find out who the CEO is, and there's one piece of video content or there's five interviews and one's in video and one's on YouTube and we super distribute it. And how often do you get to spend an hour or two hours with somebody? So nobody really knew who Chris Sacco was. He was this like weird right. guy in Silicon Valley who was doing stuff. With Maybe, the shirt. Yeah, the shirt. It's kind of annoying no one, sometimes. No one and, really knows who Chris Sacco is. And they is. still don't. Yeah. But, you know, he was just kind of enigma. And then he spent three hours on the podcast doing this like two part with us. And to this day, it, it still gets thousands of views per month, per month. And the the goodwill that we're able to generate helping Evernote get, you know, whatever, you know, the first you know, 1,000 out of the first 25,000 subscribers or something. Or yeah. with Uber, when Travis was on, he got three city managers who listened to the podcast and then said, I'm in Chicago. I want to run Chicago. I want to run LA. I want to run New York. So Josh in New York and the LA guy and the Chicago uh, city leads, they all just listened to the podcast. and like, oh, that company's really cool. And then they started emailing Travis at Uber. Obviously, the CEO has the first name at company name. Uh, so it's really good for goodwill too, I find. It also makes me smarter. We so, did a, we were early in Everdo days too. We were on Leo Laporte's, uh, I think it was probably in This Week in Tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point I did, I did the analytics on it and like Leo Laporte was responsible for bringing in something like 6% of all of our users in the first like year. It was just like a crazy. crazy stat like that. It was just like a, an actual measurable amount that came from like one thing. Which doves back into that authenticity. Yeah. You know, podcasts cannot exist in an inauthentic fashion. Yeah. I mean, that's like crazy Z morning radio, you know, like, hey, everybody, it's a Z morning zoo, you're calling, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like, So how do you not, do that a hundred times a year? I It's super easy for me. I'm an extremely high extroverted person, ENTJ uh -huh. type, Myers-Briggs. And so after a conversation, I leave the conversation with more energy, more ideas, and more enthused to take on the world. The exact a, opposite of me. Right. You'll get out of this and you'll be like, oh, God, Jake, I was just so exhausting. I need to go have an hour alone to recoup. Um, but then when you're recouping, that's the power of those introverts. It's like they're recouping and they're like plotting and they come up with ideas. Designing the world. Designing the world, exactly. But for me as an extrovert, you know, I, I would be doing that at lunch anyway. So what I tell people is like, I'm recording two of my lunches a week and getting paid, you know, $10,000 to do so. and 250,000 people who watch every episode now get to experience it. And then they get to experience it for the next 10 years. So it's just a wonderful way for people to learn too. I, I just answered a question on Reddit's entrepreneurial forum and somebody was complaining. It was like the top post of the day. And he's like, the hardest thing about being a founder is dealing with all this free advice everywhere. And I wrote, yeah, that's not the hardest thing. I was like, that's not the hardest thing. <laughs> 25 years ago, there was no information on the internet on how to negotiate a convertible term, convertible note, what a convertible note was, what a term sheet was that didn't exist on the internet. And if you asked another founder, can I see a term sheet? They'd be like, uh, I'm, not so, I'm not supposed to show you. Now there's like a hundred videos. Here's how to negotiate with Sequoia over your term sheet. Here's how YC does their term sheet. YC is like, here's our term sheet on our website. You know, like it's completely unpacked for people on a global basis how to make startups. So does that raise the bar? It does two things. One, more people try. And two, more people get further. 
However, cynical people will look at it and say, oh my God, there's so much noise. There's too many startups. There's too many startups. I look at it and go like, well, if you think of like half of these as projects, like take the word startup and company out of them, just a project, who cares? Like people are cutting their teeth, you know, in school or high school, making a project that could become a business. And so I'm all for it. But there's a lot of like VCs now that I'm on the other side of the table and invest like VCs are so obnoxious. They're like, oh, my God, you email me about your startup. It's like, that's the job. Like, it's literally the job. You're upset that a founder emailed you. Like today, you, you'll see all of these narcissistic, insane, non-hardworking working venture capitalists freaking out about how people talk to them. Shout out to the Midas list. Whatever. You know, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's actually... <laughs> All right, before well, it gets to the Midas list, <laughs> okay. we're going off here. Before it gets to the Midas yeah. list, uh, I want to like answer the, the 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 reader or the listener question, and with you know with a hard no. Uh, unless I know a lot more about you or your startup, I'm just going to say no. You should not have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I think like probably 99 percent of the startups shouldn't, and certainly shouldn't have a podcast for the purpose of building the brand. Like you should have a podcast if you enjoy it and you think you're good at it and it's a way to like blow off steam and talk to people and have some like good ideas. Um, but most people aren't going to be good at it. And yeah, the world doesn't need another, another podcast. Right. Hobbies are great, but yeah. Yeah. If you, if you love doing it yeah. and, and you have a specific purpose for doing it, one of them could be recruiting people. Yeah. Another one could be interviewing the guests. So like some people are doing it as a front to meet important, powerful people. By the way, that's how I started I was like, you know, I like doing this. I like interviewing people. Let me see what happens, right? But it can be a huge distraction. I mean, if you're a f one of the most important things for founders to do is to say no and to understand what's important. Yeah. Like make a product that somebody loves and can't shut up about. And founders, the amount of distraction they will put in front of themselves before achieving that. Yeah. Simple, basic. There is somebody who loves this product that I made. Well before there's a lot of people, We're well before you think about scale, well before you think about how big can you get, it's like, how good can you get? Can you actually, can you get, can you weave yourself into the fabric of someone's life? Can you so, blow their mind like multiple times a week or a day? Even if it's a small number of people, and then, then you can grow from there. Yeah, I mean, in the podcast, when we started, we were getting like a couple of hundred people downloading. We're like, this is crazy. Like, this episode has a thousand downloads. There's a thousand people in the world who listened to this. We were like, our minds were blown. Like more people than I'll ever meet in my whole life. <laughs> well, yeah, we were looking at it like how many lunches could we have or how many, you know, meetups could we have? Because at the time we were doing meetups of 20 people, 30 people. Sure. That's kind of how the industry networked. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is like 30, 30 person network, you know, at once in our conference room. It's like super powerful for us. And then people started listening to it from around the world, which became like super mind blowing. Um, but yeah, it's super important for founders to stay focused. That's the number one killer of startups is just founders not being focused. Um, and that, that's I what I'm doing. I don't know that's number one killer of startups. But mm, founders giving up would be number one. Yeah. Running out of money, having dumb ideas, poor execution, right? Unpack that. Bad yeah. advice. Yeah. I, even focus is a little at... bit overrated. Focus is kind of a hindsight thing. In hindsight, you have to just write them out of focus, right? If you like do one thing and it doesn't go well, then you're like, ah, oh, you were thinking too narrowly. If you do a lot of things and it doesn't go well, he's like, ah, oh, you weren't focused. Like focus, like good focus mm. is something that you can have in hindsight. It's pretty rare to have it uh, looking forward. I'll have people though who have five app ideas and pursue five at once. Yeah. And they've never made one. So, you know, it's like, it would be one thing for Elon to run Tesla and SpaceX or Jack to do Square and Twitter. Man, if you're a first-time founder and you're trying to do three things and your nonprofit organization and your podcast company and your, yeah. you know, it's like, well, that's true. That's that's the sort of distraction I'm talking about. One good idea plus one good idea usually equals zero good ideas. One good idea plus another good idea. So yeah, that's probably right. Now we're going to talk about AI in a practical format, in the way we see it reflected in the real world. So what's, what's an interesting use case that y'all have stumbled across over the last couple of weeks? I had an interaction a couple of days ago. I was um, having a conversation uh, with some people, 
uh, standing in the kitchen. And um, I guess I was like leaning on my watch wrong or something. I have an Apple watch on. And all of a sudden, kind of in the middle of this conversation, uh, Siri comes on very loudly and says, that's a very interesting question, Phil. <laughs> um, which was super bizarre. Uh, so basically, like what, what had happened was um, Siri, you know, was activated accidentally. By the way, Apple... I never intend to activate Siri <laughs> ever. Like, especially not on my MacBook. Like, oh, yeah. It, 100% yeah. of the time that yeah. Siri's come on, on my MacBook, That's, I did not want it to. Right, right. I hit the wrong like, button. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. It's mostly like, embarrassing, almost, yeah. always at the wrong time. Yeah. I, but, but, you know, we got activated accidentally and then didn't understand what I was saying because I didn't, you know, I was talking to a person and through my sleeve or whatever. But then its error condition was, oh, that's an interesting question, Phil, which is terrible design. Yeah, because well, like, it doesn't mean, oh, it's an interesting question. It means I didn't understand. Right. But it's trying, but the designers are trying to make it seem more human or conversational. This is like, this exactly violates the AI design principles that we've been talking about here, where like, it just seems stupider because it says it's an interesting question. It's like patronizing. Like, exactly. no, it wasn't an interesting question. Right. <laughs> Watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been better if it just said I didn't understand you. Yeah, here's the time. It would have been even better if it hadn't been like triggered, you know, randomly. Right. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, here's the time. <laughs> exactly. But instead it kind of violated all these principles and like pretended to be jokey and plucky and make me feel good. And, that, and it like, it made itself feel stupid. It embarrassed me. Right. Because like, like, think about it, right? Like I'm, I'm in a conversation with a few people. It would have been less embarrassing had the thing said, like, I couldn't understand. Right. Because then it's like, okay, well, yeah, you like leaned on this thing and it didn't understand as opposed to saying it's an interesting question, which now everyone is like, oh, that's, that's weird. Would it have better? Would it have been better if it was like, "Ow, <laughs> yeah, <Yes. laughs> stop, stop leaning, leaning on me." <laughs> I like that. I think that's right. So I think I think that the the tip for AI product designers is like, really, really cut the it, cut it, the shit. It never pays to try to be clever. Yeah, it never pays to be clever. So I have the op. I have I have a bunch of Google products in the house, and I have a Google phone, and blah blah blah. One of those, and I notice it. It doesn't take on, it takes on a human form occasionally, but it's always very subservient. And like, right. it, if you swear at it, it just lets it go. And it's like, yes, sir, <laughs> I understand. I will change to the next song. You don't, you don't like this song. You especially don't like this song. Right. I just pretend to be a practical AI product when I'm having conversations with people. Right. Um, which makes them freak out. But um, for one, one, one instance that was a few weeks ago, um, I told my partner I was downloading all of these. I'm putting my out of office on and blah, blah, blah. And he sends me a text in the evening and was like, um, hey, are you still up? And I was like, this is Kathy's auto response. Mm -hmm. uh, she is not able to answer your call right now or your message right now. Um, please leave a message. And he thought that was that was really an AI um, speaking to him. And I got a good laugh at it. He didn't because he was like, well, was it real or was it you just messing with me? That sounds like a practical yeah. that AI type yeah. use case. Yeah. We do have a, you know, we have a law against AIs pretending to be human. I guess there's no law against humans pretending to be AI. So <laughs> right. I think, I think, I think you're in the clear on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It could be like a Halloween costume. Yeah. 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 I'll be Amy. So we're going to take another listener question. And this one comes in on the Facebook page, actually. Um, so our question today is asking about SIFT, a new All Turtles product that is sort of an experiment in news therapy. So SIFT is an app that presents readers with a fact-checked, very thorough breakdown of important issues. Um, and the first one, the first sort of channel, is on immigration policy in the U.S. And it allows people to stay informed without drowning in the anxiety-inducing paid news headlines in uh, in typical U.S. media. And there's no Trump. What's that? There's no Trump on SIFT. There's, there's nary a mention of Trump in SIFT? None. That's probably an intentional choice. <laughs> but so in regards to SIFT, Vicky from Facebook, she asks, does SIFT remove biased statements and opinions and just report the facts? It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really do either of those things. Um... So SIFT is, is an experiment, uh, and uh, the problem that we're experimenting with, the problem that we're trying to solve is a lot of people are just really freaked out by the news. They're just like, they're anxious, they're exhausted. This is just very common. There's been all sorts of studies on this. And uh, this has pretty bad effects. I mean, just it's bad for people's mental health, but it also causes people to check out. 
In fact, a lot of times you hear recommendations about how like the way to deal with this is to like turn off, like shut down. I have lots of friends who just pretty much don't, they try very much not to like read the news. And, you know, we think that's maybe okay for some people, but like, I don't, I find that more stressful. Like I want to know what's going on. Yeah. I want to stay engaged. I don't think apathy gets anything done. Yeah. And definitely, probably not a good long-term answer for, for society. So we uh, are running some experiments about can we present the news in a way that's more tactile, more slower, more meditative, in a way to just basically reduce that that level of anxiety. We we were calling it news therapy. Um, so you know, yeah, you could do your breathing exercises, but but you can also do that in a way that actually lets you engage with the topic. And we're not sure if it's going to work. We have some some theories about what would what would make that happen. SIFT is really a user experience, a, a UX experiment um, in this world of, of AI and partisanship and, you know, targeted ads that we're living in. Like, what could an experience be that would make you feel more human and more dignified? Uh, and so we're trying that. It's not really reporting. You can learn a lot from it, but it's not meant for that. And it definitely isn't trying to, um, you know, remove bias or anything it's 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 you know it's written by a team of of human reporters and editors and there's some there's some ai that's helping us do research and, and find it but it's meant to be this you know curated therapeutic experience we're gonna we're gonna run keep running this test for a few weeks and then we're gonna see kind of how it goes so if you want to participate just go and download uh sift uh news therapy from the uh, ios app store it's only available for apple for iphone right now and uh, go through it and then just answer the survey before and after. Because that, that's really what we're after is we're after, we're after the information. We don't know whether it's going to be a real product yet. But uh, if it looks like it's working, then, uh, then yeah, then we'll, we'll, we will make the experiment into a real product in the future. Are there any results or kind of early signals that it might be reducing stress by, by some percentage or in some specific area? Uh, there, are, there are results. Um, but since the test is still ongoing, I think it'd be, you know, bad scientific form for me to kind sure. of tip what those are. So, yeah, so we, we, we've set a, a, a predefined period of time for how long we're going to run the tests and, and like, let's just do that. So, yeah, so people by all means go and check it out, uh, tell us what you think, and then we will, uh, we'll talk about it in the podcast. We'll talk about the results are, if the results are bad and we decide not to do it, we'll, we'll talk about that as well, just right. because we've kind of done this as a public experiment. Um, and if there's also good, we'll talk about that and make it into a real product. In fact, there's a lot of interesting sort of experimental work gone into SIF that I think would be fun to share with the audience on how, how yeah. we came up with it and how we executed it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great question. If you have any other questions, please email us at hello at all dash turtles dot com or you can always tweet us. The hashtag is hashtag ask AT. Ask us a question. <laughs> yeah. Do 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 do. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the amazing Donatello Studios in San Francisco, California. Thanks to Jason for joining us this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy Thompson for production supervision and editorial management, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening. <laughs>